All right, rock and roll. So this is um, a Surge modular synthesizer. Um, to give you just a little bit of history before we dive in, um, Serge Shrepnin is a composer and instrument designer, um, Russian-American, spent a lot of time in Paris. He currently lives about an hour out of Paris. Um, he was working at a place called Cal Arts, um, which is the California Institute for the Arts, back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and so he was working with people like Morton Sobotnik of... Um, Silver Apples for the Moon fame, um, and also working with Donald Buchler, who designed the original Buchler synthesizers. Um, he was composing, working with these modular systems, and he had an idea to create his own system um, for a couple of reasons. One of the things that he didn't like about the Buchler system, or that he found cumbersome, was that first of all, they were very expensive. So at the time, the places that actually had Buchler systems were generally institutions that had the funds for it. Um, and also there was something about Buchler's designs that he um, he didn't really vibe with, and that was that a lot of Buchler modules are very multifunction, and um, and there's a lot of complexity in one module. And so what that means is that when you're kind of patching things up, there's certain things about the instrument which kind of tell you what to do um, when you're working with it, right? So there's a lot of um, uh, musicality embedded in each one of the modul modules, which is fantastic for a lot of things. But what Serge was interested in was designing synthesizers and synthesizer modules that will allow you to get to the um, many functions that are inside one Buchler module, for instance. So rather than um, just having one dial that would move things, he, he would open up the function. So something that may be one module ends up being a number of different modules with distinct functionalities. So what does that mean for composing and for working with a synthesizer? What it means is that you're thinking at a much lower level. Um, and he developed this concept which he called patch, patch programmability. So that means that in order to create a particular function, you have to kind of patch and program that function by yourself. Um, some of these, um, these modules that we've got in here and the panels are much later surge designs, so they're kind of less low level. These two panels at the top um, are direct recreations of his 1973 to 75 um, systems, which was the very original surge system. So you'll see as I kind of go through them in the next couple of weeks, um, that there's a really low level approach. And what that, what that means is that um, as we're kind of patching things up, there are decisions that you make um, based on the very low level um, functions that you're building that you might not otherwise come to if you're working with a, a much more kind of complex module. That's not to say that we can't get complexity with a, with a system like this. Okay, cool. So what we've got here, as I mentioned, is we've got two 73 to 75 panels. Um, the big Surge paper face that I might have shown you a picture of um, a while ago, I sent a link to, it, um, to a workshop I did on it, um, a couple of years ago. This is a recreation of that. So all of the, the modules you would find in an original system. This is um, designed by a guy called Jonas, um, or he's called, he calls himself the human comparator. He's based in Sweden. Um, so this is a home-built system. I commissioned it and did not build it because I can not solder for my life. Um, but these, these are yeah, original recreations of that. These three other panels here um, are preformed, kind of populated, um, panels by a Berlin-based company called Random Source. Random Source, um, as of maybe a year or two ago, has employed Serge Shrepnin back as their chief kind of innovation officer. So he's now working with Random Source and kind of recreating his old, old designs. They've been around for a while. A lot of these modules um, and the way that they work date back to kind of early 80s Surge designs. So there's a um, there's a lineage between the very early what we call paper face designs and the Surge um, modular or Surge STS um, system from that time. All right. So um, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the panels today, and then just patch up a couple of things and discuss the differences in workflow between this and say the Eurorack system that we have available, um, and also the um, VCV rack that we've seen. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to kind of zoom in and then go through a few of the things that we've got available here. So we're going to start at the top with the 73 to 75 modules with original knobs. Very important. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So um, what you might see if I zoom in even closer. Oh shit! What did I do? No signal. Something happened with the HDMI. Oh, no, please, please, please. 
Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. So if we have a look, even just at the panel graphics, without me kind of describing everything that, that they do, hmm. Hmm, you'll notice that the panel graphics themselves almost look kind of like hieroglyphics. They're a little bit harder to understand than your general modular system. And this was actually quite a, um, look at this artistic panning that I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, this was intentional on Serge's part um, to name things based on their electronic functions rather than musically what is possible with them. And the reason for that is he didn't want to presuppose what a musician might actually um, want to do with a system like this. Of course there are some recognisable things like the name reverb, ring, which might stand for re, uh, ring modulator, um, gates, etc comparators, um, but the way that you interface with them is quite different to, um, I guess, the panel graphics and the way that you might think of an original system, uh, sorry, of, of a modular system that you um, know and love. If we have a look at the, um, the bottom, the second panel down here, we've got some um, more recognizable modules. This, these are um, envelope generators, so they're envelopes, a AD envelopes, meaning attack to K, very similar to what we um, know and love in maths, um, but there's a few things that are quite particular about them and as you'll notice as we talk about the, um, the paper face panels in particular, in order to get them going and make, make them do what you would like them to do, say a looping envelope or something, there's not just a button to press to make it loop, you have to patch it up. All right? And this is like the real essence of patch program ability. So if we have a look over here, we've also got these things called positive and negative slews, which I don't think um, corresponds to anything that we would really understand in, a, in another modular system, but they really are multifunction modules that you can think of as multiple things like um, an envelope or an oscillator or even a low pass filter, um, all can be done with the same modules. All right, if we take a look at the recreations of the more modern designs, and when I say modern, 80s, um, it's much more tightly packed. There's a lot more going on um, in each one of these panels. And you, you have some modules that are a, a bit more kind of um, self-contained. So if you uh, look at the left there, we've got the new timbral oscillator. Um, that's an oscillator with lots of ins and outs, lots of different functionality that you wouldn't find on the originals. Um, we've got audio mixers, wave multipliers, which you were hearing a little bit before, uh, if you were here as I was making sound. That's a, a beautiful kind of distortion module. And then we've got some randomization slopes and as you'll hear, the gorgeous um, filters. On the, on the right here is the stereo mixer. That's where I've got my outputs going to, the, um, going to the door. Over here, we've got some more filters. This is the mantra panel. So we've got a crossfader, um, VCAs, this is the really famous dual universal slope generator, um, which is basically everything from an envelope to a oscillator, etc. Got a little sequencer programmer on the left, which is a ten-stage sequencer um, with two different rows, and then down here, you will probably recognise this design from the um, sequencer that we were using last week in the um, Eurac system, which is the pressure points and brains, right? So pressure points and brains took this um, panel down here, which is called the Touch Activated Keyboard Sequencer, the TKB for short, um, took that and basically recreated a lot of the functionality um, for the modern synthesizer. All right, so um, we're gonna go just up the top here and I wanna talk a little bit about things like um, self-triggering, getting a sound out, um, and also, before we actually do that, talking about the different kinds of cables that we're using in a surge system. So um, to, to just start off, I don't have a normal Eurac um, cable here with me, but we all know what a 3.5 cable looks like. What we've got here is, if that's going to, um, it's not going to focus, but no, it won't, but that's all right. So this is what we call a banana cable. So banana cable, if you want to, I'm just going to throw a couple of rounds so you can um, see what they look like. Okay, so they're called a banana cable. Traditionally, these, these cables you would find in um, electronic test equipment. Um, and 
the advantage of these, there's a couple of different advantages of these. Um, well, first of all, they're a different size to a normal Eurorack cable, so you cannot put these in another modular synthesizer, and you can't put Eurorack cables in this synth, so they have um, a, a different format. Um, the other thing is that every single one of these cables is what we call stackable. So if you see here, I wish this would focus, but um, if you see here, we have a hole at the bottom of each, of each cable. G'day. Um, we have a, bottom a hole at the bottom of each cable, and we also have a hole at the top. What that means is that we can take a signal, I'm just going to show you a quick example. If I take a signal out of here, and I put it, thank you so much, um, and I put it down here, uh, if I have, and I put it over here, for instance. If I want to reuse that same signal, then we can stack this output and put it somewhere else. And because they're really sturdy, you can then stack and stack and stack. All right. So it means that it's really extensible um, and, and a lot easier to get these kind of mul multiplying effects that we have in, if you remember that module that we used last week in the Eurorack system, the malt. All right, so we don't need a malt in this system at all because we use the cables for that purpose. It's exactly the same thing. It's a passive malt. Uh, it it is only passive though. It can't be paired with powered so that it multiplies. Yeah, so if you're, if you're wanting to send the exact same signal to pitch, then there'll be that drift that we talked about. Um, last week. But um, what what you lose out from that kind of precision of a powered or a buffered malt, um, it certainly makes up for in, in its um, extensibility. Right. Cool. All right. So let's, let's talk about um, this top panel here. All right. So what we've got at the top, I'm just going to go through each one of the modules. We've got an oscillator. This oscillator I know has a tiny little issue, and that is that it doesn't stay stable in terms of its pitch very much. Um, it needs to get looked at. I'll fix that. Um, this one here is a triple wave shaper. Wave shaping is just a form of distortion. So there's three of them. This one here is a peak and trough. We'll get to that. This is like a, a logic circuit. Um, if you put things into each one of these, what it spits out is the highest control voltage at any point. So if you've got two envelopes going up and down, it'll only output the higher of, of the two. All right? So it's an analog logic circuit. Okay, it's like a and or, and then the the through is the or, all right. So which is only I'm sorry trough rather not through, um, which is showing you um, only bringing out the lowest of whatever's in there. Okay, so you can do a bunch of different control voltage things with it. You can also use it as a VCA if you want to. All right, a comparator here takes a signal and and another signal and it compares the two, um, and it will output a, a pulse or a gate. Um, and so you can create square waves using that. This is a dual processor. Um, do you remember in maths, in the center of maths, we had a couple of attenuators, so you could scale positive or negative a signal. Um, these are like little um, three input attenuators. So on the right, you get positive. On the left, you get negative. And then you have an offset here, which can scale everything up. All right. And then it spits out the mix of those in each one of these. Okay, then we have a gate, this is a VCA. It's got a linear and a logarithmic input. Um, and then we've got a ring modulator here and a reverb. The reverb, I did get calibrated and, and fixed, but it needs to be fixed. There's a, um, there's a reverb tank in the back here. This is a preamp circuit, so you can put in an external signal. So you can put in like a guitar or, or another synth or something, and then gain it up and bring it into the system. Okay, cool, which is awesome. Positive sluice and negative sluice is the first thing that we'll, we'll get to so that we can really understand this idea of patch programmability. A positive slew, think of it as, I, was, I, th I think the, probably the best way to think of what a positive slew is, is it's a rising ramp, okay? So if we think of an envelope, like an AD envelope, we've got an attack and we've got a decay. What the positive slew is, is it's just the attack portion, okay? So if I were to send a signal into it, it would generate a ramp and based on the control here. Okay, if it's on the left, it's the shortest ramp possible. If it's on the right, it's the longest ramp, which is kind of the opposite of the way that we think of, sorry, it's the other way around, my bad. <laughs> that's the longest ramp possible and that's the shortest ramp possible. Okay, so it's the opposite of an envelope, the way that we would see an envelope attack and decay. Okay, the reason for that is that Serge always thinks in frequency. So think of it this way, if you've got something that's controlling pitch or frequency, 
or speed. Always think that to the left is the slowest, so lowest frequency. To the right is the, the fastest frequency. Okay, cool. So we've got two positive slews here. They also have gate outputs. So when you get to the end of rise, it'll give you a gate. All right, you've got two of them here. We'll talk about the difference later. And then you've got two negative slews, which is the opposite. Okay, so it's just a falling ramp. Um, and again, this pot here, to the left, really fast, to the right, really slow. No, the other way around. <laughs> really <laughs> fast, really slow. Okay, cool. Then we've got three envelope generators. So if you're thinking about using these just as envelopes and you find it complex, then realize that you've actually just got three dedicated envelope generators here, which will do exactly what you want them to. They've got an attack and a decay or a release. Again, that is the fastest, that is the slowest. Over here, you've got a, um, a duration um, CV input. So if you put in a CV, it's going to change and scale the overall speed, the overall um, attack and, and decay time of your of your envelope. Okay, um, cool. So and then over here, this is what we call a um, a formant jumbler, or a, what's the other word for it? Um, it just basically changes the format. So you can you can um, take in a um, a banana um, cable and then take out a Eurorack cable. Okay, so if you want to send, and the other way around as well. So if you want to send stuff from the Eurorack system to control this or anything else with a 3.5, you can take it out to Banana Land. Um, or if you want to take out Banana Land and put it into the Eurorack system, you can do that. Okay, cool. We're going to talk about these three panels in, in a second, but let's just do some kind of basic stuff with the, um, with the top panel so we can see what's going on. First of all, I'm going to take out um, just the oscillator at the top so you can hear it. It might wobble around a little bit, but there's other oscillators that are much more stable. I'm going to take this oscillator up the top. When you see something that is a brown um, uh, jack, what that means is it's bipolar. Okay, So it's AC, which is alternating current. It's generally used for audio. Okay, So I'm going to take that one here, and I'm going to put that in my stereo mixer. Move, move down so you can see. We all know what a mixer looks like, but if you can have a look at it. The mixer input, black or brown, it's accepting a bipolar input. You've got pan over here, left and right, which you can CV, so we don't have to pa patch up what we did last week. And then you've got a volume pot, which is also controllable. So this is this um, stereo mixer, and there's two channels, um, is a multifunction module. It does panning, it does CV, um, control over pan, and it also does volume. So let's just turn on this oscillator and have a listen. See, it's a bit, wob it's a bit wobbly, this one. Okay, cool. Oh, whoa. Okay, cool. All right, to start with, this is what Serge would call a sine wave. It doesn't really sound like a sine wave. It's got a bit of buzz to it. Um, that's pretty classic analog um, synthesis of this time. What we have in this um, oscillator is we've got a wave shaping pot. So if we remember this STO last week, that um, little module that, that did some wave shaping. We have a way of changing the wave shape here. Okay, cool. You've got your... Okay, cool. So what we're going to do first is I want to show you how you can patch up a simple envelope using positive and negative slews. We're going to do them individually first, and then we're going to find a way of actually making them work together. Okay, so I've got a series of different sized cables. We've got these short ones over here. Um, we've got a little longer, a little longer, and then our long ones. Um, I've also got what we call shorting bars, which we can use for these um, bottom ones. All right, so I'm going to take this positive slew here. And anything that's got a triangle on it is generally going to be an input, okay? Um, and then you've got your jacks up here in a square there. That means it's going to be an output. So if I show you here the way to patch this one up, I'm going to take this bottom gate, which is the end of rise, and I'm going to put it into 
its input. So what that means is that when it's at rest, this is outputting a high voltage. All right, it's always outputting high. So it's saying, I'm done, I'm ready, okay? Then when I put it in the input, the input triggers this ramp, okay? And so as soon as it does that, this goes low, okay? And then when it gets to the top, what does it do? It goes high again. So what I've done by patching it to itself is I've created an oscillation, all right? So this is basically, you know, more or less what an oscillator is doing. It's allowing it to, when it gets to the top, come back again, all right? But I've, I've patched it up. So you can't hear anything at the moment. I'm gonna make it slow and we're gonna put its output here into one of the two CV inputs of this oscillator. Now back in 1973, um, this particular oscillator did not have volt per octave at all. So it's really something that you gotta tune, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can't, can't be creating your, um, your beautiful major. Sorry Ben, melodies uh, the, the, um, the ramp as well, yep. that was just the attack portion of it. This is it? the positive salute, that's right. So it's yep. only like the, the sawtooth. Yeah, have a listen. Oh. You've got to twiddle the knobs a little bit to get rid of that. See what's going on? Okay, so the positive slew, when it, when it cycles back on itself, it goes to audio rate, all right? So that's what I mean by multifunction. It can be something that is a control voltage, or if I don't use this, um, the oscillator at all, and I just take the output, I just take the output of the positive slew itself, have a listen. It's an oscillator, okay? Oh, so good. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I'm taking the output of the of the ramp. Obviously, we're not hearing it as a ramp, right? Because we, we just hear the top of it. But if I take that out, I can also just hear that end of rise gate. So what do we got? Let's go square wave. Okay. Let's take the other one. See what it does. Nothing, because I keep forgetting what this output actually does. Um, I think that's like a tiny little blip which you, you're not going to hear. So there you go. Square wave. Sawtooth wave. Alright. Cool. So let's put it back in, old mate. Um, Okay, cool. So that's a thing. Awesome. Um, before we get to, thanks mate. <laughs> um, I'm gonna need that. Um, so <laughs> bef be before we get to actually look in the envelope generators, what I wanna do is show you how you would patch up a, an AD envelope using a positive slew and a negative slew. First of all, let's just have a listen to the negative slew. So we'll take this one and we'll put it in the negative slew's output. And then we got to cycle it up upon itself. Okay, now it's going down. Do, 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 do. Gabba. All right, cool. All right, so, so. Yeah. All right, so let's think about this. Now we need to use our, our um, thinking caps. So what, I feel like I'm a year, like a year four teacher saying that. Um, <laughs> all right, so if I wanted to create a, a, a rising and a falling envelope, what would I need to patch up with a positive and negative flu? How would they work together? 
positive slew reaches the top, it triggers yeah. the negative slew. Exactly, exactly. So let's have a look. So when the positive slew reaches its top, gate. the gate into the negative slew, okay? And now what? Is this one going? When the negative slew reaches the bottom, you trigger the positive slew. Exactly. Okay, so this is called cross patching. So this one will not go until the negative slew stops and this one will not go until the positive slew stops. Okay, so let's have a look. We'll put them both at noon. That's not working. So I've done something wrong. No, no. Okay, I think it's... There we go. So instead of taking the gate out, you actually actually take its its signal out. So now we're just hearing the positive because the negative is super fast. And if I and now we're just hearing the negative because the positive is super fast. But if I put them here like this. That's an envelope, back and forth, all right? But we don't have to stop there. We can have another one, cycling underneath. There's a positive, and we use its output to voltage control the positive. We might take this one and voltage control this one. working off each other, right? Now, one thing that you might have noticed is that in these two panels, there is zero visual feedback. There's no blinking lights at all, okay? Um, and that might be just a little bit daunting at first. Um, so that's why what I've done to, to describe um, the functionality of these sets of modules is I put them into something that we can immediately hear, which is an oscillator, okay? Cool. Now, you could use this same process for a bunch of different things. Um, these um, attack and release envelopes I'm using for pitch, but could, you could use them for timbre, for instance. Um, we could do that now. So instead of instead of taking the um, instead of taking the output of this little process here and putting it into pitch, I could put it into the wave shape up the top, and so we'd have a stable pitch with a changing wave shape. So that's interesting. Okay, cool. And then you might, you might do something else where you might have another looping envelope, this one here for instance. So I have to take the end output at the top and put this into the cycle input down the bottom. So as I mentioned, these envelopes will not cycle without you patching it up. So I'm programming a behavior here. And here what I'll do is I'll take this one and I'll control the volume. I need a longer cable. Oh. So I'm going to put this one here, down into here. Whoa. 
it's immediately quite expressive. Okay. Now there's something else that's missing. And take another envelope. And what we're going to do is we're going to pan that. And this will be exponentially quicker than last week. Okay, so if we take a look at, at the mixer over here, you've got, if I just move these guys over here, you've got your pan pot over here. So if I move that um, with my hand, it's going to pan left to right. Same with this one. Um, but important to know is that what's coming out of the envelope is, um, is a unipolar vol voltage, okay? So, which means it's only positive, right? So if this is in the center, you can see, if I zoom in, you can see that, that there's an arrow. There, do we see that arrow down there? Okay, what that means is that if this is all the way over to the left, a positive voltage will move it to the right, all right? If you have a look at on this one, there's an arrow on the other way. What that means is that a positive voltage, when it's all the way over this way, will move it to the left. So it allows you to basically use the same, if you wanted to use the same control voltage, you could, you could pan both of these in different directions. Okay? So what I've got is a unipolar voltage coming from my, one of my envelopes, and it's going to pan this. And that's completely decoupled, meaning it's not related at all to my, um, my envelopes that are changing timbre, or the envelope which is changing volume. So let's put that back in so we can hear the the volume and you can hear that it's only on the left now right so let's take this one and I'm going to put that you just have to trust me I'm putting it in the panning input Actually, sounds really beautiful. Um, cool. All right. So as we're as we're doing this, we're realizing that what we've done here is we've kind of we've patched up something. It's doing its thing. It's pushing and pulling upon each other, just like we talked about with the VC, VCV rack thing when we did amplitude modulation. Um, similar to what we were doing um, last week with some things as well. And I've kind of like. If, if anyone knows much about programming, I've kind of like encapsulated that process, all right? So what I mean by that is I've made a thing and I put it in a box and I forget what's going on underneath. I don't have, to, I don't have the brain space to think about all the details that's going on. But I do know that there are some outputs that I can use to control other things, all right? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna relate what's going on here to some kind of movement in pitch and I'm going to do that using a sequencer, and then I'm going to describe some of the other things. All right. So um, there's a lot more going on on this top panel um, that I would love to um, discuss with you. Um, we might get to that next week. But what we're going to do is basically just take this patch and kind of run with it a little bit. OK, so let's have a look. What have we actually got that we can use here? This one here is doing volume as it goes up and down, it also has an end output, all right? And I'm using that, that end to trigger itself, but I might use that end to do something else as well, which is what I'll do, okay? There's also all of these other little ones here that we, we, can, we can do something with. So let's, let's, take the, let's take the end first. Okay, I'm just gonna describe one little thing that I'm gonna do here. Um, instead of taking the oscillator directly, um, I'm actually going to prove this malting exercise and I'm going to extend the cable because I want to put it all the way down into another, into another VCA so you can see what's going on. I'll just move it down. So this is like a crossfader. I'm going to put it into the input here. I'm going to take its output, which also has a, a 6.5 mil if you want to take it out elsewhere. I'm going to put it in here. And what that means is that if I take my envelope, I'm gonna use this envelope to control volume. So now the volume is being controlled with a different VCA, not with this one. That allows me to turn up the overall volume, right? 
All right, and control the overall volume. Otherwise, I don't have control over the overall volume. Okay, so it's submixing. Cool. All right, so let's have a look what's going on. This one here, I'm now going to take, so this is the end of my volume. I'm going to put it in the clock input of this sequencer down here. All right, so let me explain this sequencer. I'm going to zoom in so you can have a look. Okay, so this sequencer programmer has some manual touch buttons. So you can use it kind of like a, like a mini keyboard, if you like. It's got two voltage outputs, which you'll find at A and B. You also have an A minus B output, all right? Which basically will say A minus this one. So if this is at one and this is at 0.5, then the output becomes 0.5, right? Why is that useful? Because then you've got three interrelated voltages. You've got two that are separate, and then one that's like a combination of the two. It just gives you um, extra options for, for modulation. Okay, cool. So I'm clocking this. If you have a look at the lights, I've just pressed button number two. Have a look at the steps that it oscillates between. Wait, so is button number two the only one that's down, or one and two? Oh, nothing's down, they're just press buttons. Oh, but I've, okay. I've pressed button two, which means that it always resets on, on number two. It's oscillating just between two states. Number three, it oscillates between three states. And by default, it goes down. But if you have a look, yeah. you've got an up and down. Yeah. Okay, so I can change the direction if I want. And if I want all 10 steps, I press the top. Are there 10? There's 10 steps. No, there's one, two, three, four, eight steps, my bad. Okay, so what we want is we want to take A and we're going to put that in the pitch of this guy. Okay, so it's, it's got a bit of an offset to it. Hmm. All right. So listen, let's add some, add some pitches. So that's a, it's a pretty simple patch, really. We've got some movement going on with timbre. We've got movement that's going on with, with pan, and we've got movement going on with, um, with volume. Panning and tam so timbre is self-contained, volume is self-contained, and panning is self-contained, but now volume is controlling something else, all right? If we wanted to make this truly kind of a feedback patch, then we might take something that's controlling something and then feed it back. All right. So you might actually use the pitch, for instance, and change the sp speed of the panning. So the lower pitches have a slower panning, the higher pitches have a higher panning, right? Because I'm, I'm, I've stacked the same output here. Real quick with the stacking, yep. is that only for output? Or yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you can't send to, like, multiply to two? No, I mean, theoretically you can, but please don't. <laughs> um, okay. Yep. Could you then take the B output of the sequencer? Totally. Which envelope? The envelope yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. Exactly. Each note is a different length. So here, if we have a look at that envelope, good idea, Regan. If we have a look at that envelope, what I've done is I'm putting it into the duration input. 
Now, duration input is also an attenuverter, which means that if it's all the way over the, the top, it's making things faster. If it's on the, um, on the, all the way on the bottom, it's making things slower, okay? Okay, cool. Now, this is, this is fine, but what I wouldn't mind doing is changing the timbre just, just a little bit so I can show you some of the other um, modules in, in this system. So what we've got here is we've got this is the output directly of the um, of the oscillator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in the variable Q VCF. What does that mean, variable Q? What is it? Resonance? Is it talking about? Yep. So it's a variable, variable residence, yeah. exactly, yeah. Now these filters are ridiculous. Um, Serge is very well known for his beautiful filters. Um, we're going to do um, a low pass filter. So I've taken, oops, I've taken the output of the oscillator before the VCA, okay, into the variable Q VCF. We've got two of them. We've got a variable Q there and a variable Q down the bottom here. We've also got up the top another one, which is called a variable slope, which is a bit different. But we're going to use the, um, the VCFQ for now. And now I'm taking the low pass output. I'm going to put it back in where the original oscillator was. So it's low pass. So I'm going to open it right up. No Q. This is the Q here. And this is the gain. So it's fully gained up. The filter is fully open. Whoa, what? Why is it doing that? Did I do something dumb? That's right. Input, yep, correct. Oh, sorry, my bad. There we go. Okay, let's have a listen to this. Oh. Oh. Let's just get rid of the volume for now so you can hear it just by itself. Another output, so the band passed. Let's do the low pass. Okay, now that makes me think of a couple of things. Here with the VCFQ, you've got a volt per octave input, and you've also got a scalable attenuator for pitch and there's your resonance, okay? So what I'm gonna do, I've basically used up my sequencer over here, but this is probably a good time to just show you quickly the TK band, we'll do much more sequencing next week. Okay, so let's take a look over here. The TKB is 16 steps. Each one of these you can touch directly with your fingers, he says. Why is that not working? Oh, uh, keyboard needs to be on. Sorry, there's a keyboard switch over here. Go ahead and your keyboard on. And then you've got four rows of, of, um, of sequence, all right? Mm -hmm. So they come out A, B, C, and D. But you've also got an A, B, C, D up. Because, if I zoom in, check this out. There are four lights over here, and the ABCD output allows you to sequence in the Y direction as well. Oh. Okay, so you can have, let's have a look. That's sick. Okay, so if I were to take this clock that's clocking my other sequencer and clock the vertical clock, you can see I'm changing the row that's being output there. But now let's take, say, one of the outputs from our crazy fast stuff uh, up here. How artful that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, from our fast sequence, say so this one. And I'm going to go down. Follow my cable. There we go. Down. Other way, Ben. 
to the TKB, thank you, TKB. The TKB has a clock input, which is over here. It's also got a random input, so it will just randomly choose a step, and it's got uh, a direction. So I'm just gonna put this one in the clock, and you'll see the lights moving. Can you see those lights moving? Oh, yeah. All right, so those lights moving at the speed of our patched up envelope from before, and the vertical clock is, all right, so now we've got something. So let's have a look. I'm gonna go up to the VCF queue. So what we're doing here is I'm gonna change the, the, the frequency of our filter based on this process. And now I'm going to put the volume back in. That's probably not as interesting, actually. So basically we've got, for the pitch of the filter, we got 16 times 4. So what's that? 64, right? Possible states for the filter, right, that I'm using. And of course you could use, you could use it to do other things as well. I don't know, you could change the Q with another one. Just with the A row, could change the Q row. Let's do D actually. So that's changing the, the resonance. So the D row, row now is just changing how resonant the filter is. And, and when, the, um, when the Y, like the vertical sequencer is not on D, it's sending output. No, 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 because you've got a separate output for D as well. Right, so it is just, yeah. Exactly, so D's just doing that resonance. So, so the ABCD output is just its own. Is for when, is, is just, that takes both um, vertical and horizontal. Exactly, and, and then the ABCD is just. They ignore the vertical. They ignore the vertical. Exactly. Wow. Okay, cool. which is cool. Now this process here, I could say, all right, so there's a process going on underneath. And then what I do is I use the pressure output of the TKB. Pressure output, and that will be my volume. Now it's momentary. It's still going, but when I take my fingers off, nothing happens. So what we might do in this case, just to finish up, is I won't use the pressure output, but I'll use a pulse. And I'll use that pulse to open up another envelope. So we've just been using envelope cycling so far, right? So let's take, uh, let me zoom out. Opla. We've got one more envelope up the top here that we're not using. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the key pulse, which means it outputs a, a, a pulse, a gate, when I press a key. And I put that in the start of another envelope. So when I press a key, it'll trigger this envelope, okay? As I hold it down, it should stop at the top, all right? Or, or not, I can't remember. <laughs> we'll work that out as we come to it. Okay, so let's just do a really simple one. This is a quick attack, medium decay. And we'll go put that in there, so. Is that correct, Ben? There we go. Yeah, no, it won't hold it. But there's a hold input. So I could go start, hold, and it should hold it at the top. Yeah, there we go, yeah, so it'll hold it. But it still has the, the uh, envelope that you Exactly, good. But if I didn't want to do a hold, I could just, I could just make it slow and then... Okay. 
not hearing much. Probably because it's getting stuck on a on a low frequency with the with the filter. That's one way of doing things. I'm not sure if it's the greatest. Okay, cool. So uh, we've got, gotten complex pretty fast. <clears throat> Last couple of things I want to show you, just because we've we've done the VCFQ, is I want to just turn down our original process, and I'm going to grab another VCFQ. And I want to show you what the VCF can, Q can do when you think of it not just as a, a filter, but as a sound source in and of itself. So it doesn't self-oscillate. Some filters self-oscillate, like the, um, the liquidy um, filter that we were using last week in the Eurorack system. That self-oscillates, which means it can become a sine wave. Um, but if you ping a filter, has anyone heard of pinging a filter before? So if you actually send it a, um, a, a, bang, a, a like bang, like yeah, like a, um, a pulse um, with high resonance, it'll ring out, okay? So this filter is designed to do that because it's actually got a trigger input, all right? And what that does is it sends a really quick pulse. There it is, trigger input. It's a really quick pulse to a, um, to a filter. Um, and then depending on the cue settings, you can actually get a really kind of percussive timbre. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab something that is relevant to us, which is something quite fast up here, maybe this output. I'm going to put that in the trigger input. So I've taken it, um, for those just watching the video, I've taken it from one of our negative slews, trigger input, and I'm going to take the band pass output. I'm going to put it in the second input of the mixer. We'll turn it up. Okay, so let's play around with the settings. That's cool. But as soon as I increase the Q, or if I put it in the low, Where this really excels it was, is when you then FM it. So we can hear that that's a pitch, it sounds percussive. I'm gonna use one of these slope generators over here and I've gotta show you the shorting bar. So it's designed, it won't work on these top two panels, but on these panels it will. I put the end out into this input, and what it does is it cycles this envelope, right? So this is an AD envelope. We'll talk about the dual slope generator in more detail next week. So I have a look at that. I take its bipolar output and put it into this one. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm FMing a filter, right? That's cool. But I think what we're doing is, is triggering it too fast. So let's get this trigger from somewhere else. I might put it on the output. Let's have a look at the TKB. Do you see all the red? You probably can't actually. Above every one of these, whoa. Oh. <laughs> you see that? Because that's, that's changing, that's triggering the envelope. Um, Anyway, um, so above each one of these, you've got a gate output for when it hits that stage. So I'm gonna put it on the top. So it's only gonna trigger it when it gets to stage one of the sequence. Hear, hear that? Yeah. 
Where's my original sound going? It's missing. What did I do with that?